Well, we are uh, moving ahead. We're studying, uh, coming into the issues of David. Uh, we finished off last week recognizing the restoration of Samuel, the prophet, brought about the anointing of David. Uh, and so we see that he was just a kid, uh, basically, 10, 10 years old or something. Uh, but nonetheless, God had anointed him. And so for our children, uh, God has a plan for their life. It may not come, may not be evident for a few years, like with David, that's okay. Uh, we pray for them, prepare them accordingly as well. Uh, but now we're going to take a look at a portion uh, of Scripture that's kind of unusual, I have to just say. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't have been easy enough to skip over it. Uh, but nonetheless, I thought there was enough in there that necessitated our study. I thought we'd want to give our time to it, to understand uh, the matters of uh, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And not only the Holy Spirit, uh, but in fact, uh, the matters of what happens if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, for many people, in fact, many believers, they may not understand this matter. They've come to personal faith in the Messiah. Uh, but they may not understand what it is to follow the Messiah or to live the life God called them to live, which only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit, not by their own efforts, not by their own religious ideas, but it has to be the power of God that we're powerless in our flesh uh, to honor God or serve God. And so uh, we're going to understand these matters here uh, relative to our life as well. Uh, and so, because you'll be sitting for a little while, I'm going to ask you to stand up again so we can read the scriptures uh, together. Uh, let's read these, uh, these verses that are up on the screen and ask God to help us understand it. Here we go. The Spirit of the Lord rushed on David from that day forward, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So it came about. Whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. Avinu, we want nothing more than to honor you uh, in spirit and in truth, to be your worshipers and to be your witnesses. And we recognize and confess our own inadequacy in our flesh, that our flesh can overpower us, even as we stop looking to you, biding in you, trusting in you, and therefore be under the influences of the evil of this age. And so we pray that even now we might yield ourselves to the living God, recognizing our desperate need for a salvation, that is the provision of a God who loves us graciously and forever, and that we might therefore walk in the Spirit and honor the name of our God. Uh, for those of us, Lord, who are here, and uh, evil influences is all we really understand, uh, we pray that you might be gracious to us, Lord, and help people to understand the hope that they can have in Messiah, and that we might thereby be instruments of hope to others. In Yeshua's name, amen. Please be seated, if you will. As we consider uh, the matters we're looking at, we'll take a look at real difficult scriptures. Uh, some of you are aware of my library, uh, but this is a verse that more often not gets skipped over by many commentators, uh, because if it's difficult, you read it, and so you can see the problems that can arise. Uh, when we take a look at the context, uh, David is rising, Saul is sinking like a stone. And so, uh, all the scriptures from here forward will be prioritizing the life of David, uh, and eventually bringing him uh, by the end of 1 Samuel, into the, in, actually into 2 Samuel, he will be recognized as king uh, over Judah and then Israel. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, when we take a look at this verse regarding that Saul has a divine penalty upon him, uh, and a divine penalty that's sometimes very hard for us to understand. Many of us, uh, by the grace of God, 
uh, have been delivered uh, from the domain of darkness, transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. So we don't know what it means to be in the domain of darkness. We may take for granted uh, the good news for our souls. Uh, but there may be others, there may be people you know, who uh, believers, though they may be, uh, have stopped following the Lord, uh, certainly stopped following him in a consistent fashion, even giving in to their fears or their lust or whatever influences may be upon them. And the results of that is not pretty. Uh, and so if you take a look at this portion, though it may be hard to grasp some of these things, very important to comprehend the matters that, uh, that, uh, that are involved here. Uh, and so we'll take, uh, give it some attention this morning uh, regarding this particular portion of Scripture uh, because there's a basic lesson the Bible has from cover to cover uh, and from Luke chapter 12, 48, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. To much is given, much is required. And so for those who have been given a great deal of authority, much more is required. And for those of you who may have authority in the home, at work, or in the community, or here in the congregation, we can only encourage you to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because though the world says Authority tends to corrupt. Absolute authority tends to corrupt absolutely. That's the way the world thinks. It's not true. Because Yeshua shows us uh, the real truth, that he had all authority, yet there was no corruption. So authority does not corrupt people, but it reveals the corruption you may have. It reveals your corruption. And therefore, to much is given, much will be revealed, and also much will be required or expected. And so as we understand that King Saul was king of Israel, and therefore uh, had a tremendous amount of authority that he abused, uh, that he misused, uh, was all selfish and up in his own passions and his own desires. And so uh, the issue here uh, is that with all that was already said to him by uh, uh, Shmuel Hanavi, uh, Samuel the prophet, still he would not repent, but he further rebelled. He continued to resist the will of God. Uh, and so the chastening of the Lord upon him would be uh, extreme. And this, this is what the Bible says for all in leadership. It says in Jacob, the book of Jacob, you say, book of Jacob? Um, James, as it's translated, uh, in the original language, is Jacob, just saying. Point is, James chapter 3, verse 1, Be not many teachers, brethren, for you know you face a more severe condemnation. And so understand uh, uh, that those in leadership roles have to uh, walk circumspectly with the Lord, be yielded, uh, and filled all the more. And so as we consider the matter now, there's a simple outline in your bulletin. I'll have it here on the PowerPoint as well. And so as we understand the, the subject matter, spiritual judgment on unspiritual soul, unrepentant transgression brings unusual service, trials, difficulties, all kinds of problems. Unrepentant transgression will therefore bring the removal of your spiritual witness. Uh, you say, well, I don't care about that. Well, okay. Uh, it'll bring retribution upon your continual wickedness. Well, I can probably shoulder, I can soldier through that. And then you'll find results in your personal wretchedness. Ooh. At some point, I hope God gets your attention. Uh, that being a witness for the Lord is a privilege created in his image, that we might relate to God, that we might thereby represent him to be his witnesses. We worship to be a witness. And so if that means little to you, uh, then you will find yourself in difficulty. As we consider the, the portion, the spirit of Adonai departed from Saul, and so we see here the first point, rebellion brings removal of your spiritual witness. As Job uh, recognized, uh, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, and so the Lord gave and the Lord takes away in regards to the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Adonai, etc. 
And so when we consider the matter for our sakes, we want to understand the receiving uh, the Spirit's witness in our life. Uh, prior to Shavuot, or I grew up saying Shavuos, uh, prior to what's called Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, um, Messiah died on Pesach, on Passover, uh, was raised from the dead during Passover week on first fruits, uh, and then 50 days later on uh, Shavuot, Pentecost, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, was given after Yeshua resurrected, ascended into heaven, poured out the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit of Adonai came upon God's servants, uh, and in, in a similar way, you might think, like Saul, but the similarity ends very quickly. Uh, you say, well, what do you mean? Well, the Spirit of God was to actually uh, empower us uh, to be a witness for God. Uh, but differently speaking, because prior to that Shavuot, the Holy Spirit, it says in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Scriptures, it says, came upon believers. Uh, in the New Covenant, there's something different. The body of Messiah was created, uh, so to speak, there at that Shavuot. And so the Holy Spirit had a different work to do. He now not merely came upon believers, but came to indwell believers. And that was vastly different. Uh, and so though the Spirit of God came upon uh, uh, the believers in the Tanakh to help them do the work they're called to do, whether it be in building uh, the tabernacle and temple or be king of Israel, whatever it was. And so now the Holy Spirit indwells us, but for the same purposes, uh, for us to serve him. But uh, he permanently indwells the believer. In fact, the New Covenant says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, uh, 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 chapter 1, verse 22, it says there that he seals us. We're sealed in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so we want to appreciate uh, that the Holy Spirit indwells us, signed, sealed, and we will be delivered. Uh, may his name be blessed. And so sealed unto the day of redemption, it says in Ephesians 4.30. And so the new covenant is replete with scripture that assures us uh, that the Holy Spirit permanently indwells believers in Yeshua, which was different than back in the day. And that's why what David prayed in Psalm 51, I have it up on the screens for you there, as he prayed, if you remember Psalm 51, but he prayed there, take not your Holy Spirit from me, because he saw what happened with Saul, and he himself committed grievous sins, if you remember, uh, uh, adultery and then murder, and so he therefore prays this prayer, and then he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. And so why? Because he saw it was removed from Saul. And for him to be king, he needed the power of the Holy Spirit, even though he abused his power and would be chastened severely and royally. But in this particular case, uh, God chose not to remove the Holy Spirit from him. But be that as it may, we see the difference in regard to the life uh, we now live because he permanently indwells all believers. This is what the scripture tells us, that the moment you come to personal faith in the Messiah, you trust in who he is and what he's done for you, that he is the one who died in your place, bearing your sins upon himself when he died, and you say, I place my faith in him, words to that effect of some sort. Uh, but nonetheless, the whole, you don't have to have the right words, uh, that's okay, but nonetheless, trusting in the Messiah for your atonement, etc. At that point, the Holy Spirit uh, now brings the benefits of Messiah's death into your life, not only forgiveness of your sins, eternal life, a relationship with God. He comes to indwell you, empower you, and uh, enable you to serve the living God in all of these matters. This was prophesied by Yeshua. Uh, he said at the end of that Passover meal, he had his disciples before he died, John 14, 17, maybe you can see it uh, on the screen, uh, the spirit of truth. He said there, he abides with you, but notice what Yeshua said, and will be in you. You see that? And so Yeshua was giving them a heads up uh, that when Shavuot, when Pentecost came, there would be a different work of the Holy Spirit, not only with them, but in them. Uh, and so that would be a world of difference, a uh, marked difference, 
uh, for all of us as well. And so he empowers us to live for the Lord. You say, well, I'm doing pretty good without him. According to your own measurement, uh, in your opinion, you know, uh, if you must say so yourself. Uh, in other words, no, not by what God has called you to do. He wants you to live out his life, his love. He wants you to be forgiving to those who offend you. He wants you to be kind to unkind people. He wants you to be a light in the darkness. And so it's a life only he can live out through you as we study in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 13. For it's God who works in you uh, to will and to work his good pleasure. So it's God at work when you're yielding yourself accordingly. And so this is the power of the Holy Spirit that we might live out and be his witnesses at work, at school, at home, wherever it might be, even as we see from Acts 1.8. But you shall, Yeshua has told his Thomasim, his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Now, of course, starting in Jerusalem, but wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you're his witnesses, and the Holy Spirit empowers you to that. And if you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I'm not going to be a witness Forget that. <laughs> Are you kidding? Come on, people making jokes about me or not being invited to those dinner parties because I'm the religious person in the group or something. I'm not going to do that. You are resisting the Holy Spirit. And you're now living uh, not only in your own power, but you're actually denying the influence of the Holy Spirit in opening you up to whatever influence there might be. And it's all bad. It's all bad. And so as we consider the matter, there are some requirements that the Bible teaches us uh, on being a witness for the Lord, uh, living for him. Uh, and so uh, he now uh, indwells us permanently, uh, his influence and witness uh, through our life, though it can be removed, just as I just uh, intimated to you. In other words, though he permanently indwells you, you might be thinking, forget about it. <laughs> if I yield to the Lord, he might... Send me to some place like, I don't know, Africa, or China. Or I don't even know how to use chopsticks. Can't be me. Why would he send me to China? And so you have all these kind of concerns and fears and all these things going on. But the fact of the matter is you are resisting the Holy Spirit and you're therefore not yielding yourself to the very empowerment God has for you to live like he called you to live. But you have a fear or whatever you have that's dominating your life. And this like not healthy for you, not good for you. And so uh, we are commanded in Scripture to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled, to be under his influence. And so the command there, uh, as we teach ordinarily, is to be yielded, uh, and so to be yielded so that we might be yielded to his influence in our life. Uh, you know, you would wish that he made you into a robot so you could not disobey, but God doesn't want robots. He wants people of faith, people who trust him. He wants people who will love as he loves. He's not looking to program people. So the work of the Holy Spirit uh, is to influence you and empower you when you yield to his influence. And that you might now live out the life of God. And so you say, well, hold on a second. I'm, about I'm a court low. I need to be filled. Uh, I need to be topped off a little bit here. I can use a little bit more of the Holy Spirit. You know, that kind of thing going on here. How's that going to work? And so uh, when we consider it, we go over these things uh, during discipleship. So there's three commands that the Bible gives us in order to be filled with Ruach HaKodesh. And if you're not familiar with these things, you may want to make note of it, uh, because this is the lifestyle that we are called to live. And if you're not living this lifestyle, you're living contrary to what God has for you. You say, well, I'm trying my best. I'm sure you are. No one's judging your, uh, you know, your, your, your efforts. What we are saying is that you ain't got what it takes. You don't have what it takes. There's no good thing in your flesh. You need what God alone can give you. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to live the life he called you to live, to be the husband he called you to be, to be the wife he called you to be. This is what makes the difference in your life. It's really the only thing that is supposed to make a difference uh, in the Lord. And so... The first command is, grieve not the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. What do you mean? The Holy Spirit grieves every time you sin. You say, well, I didn't say it out loud. Well, you don't have to say it out loud. All your thoughts are clear before God. And so every time you have a nasty thought, 
or judging someone or suspicious minded or whatever, the Holy Spirit is now grieving over that because he knows, because you are loved by God, he knows this is detrimental for you. And if it's a lustful thought or a fearful thought, so you give in to lying or whatever, you may think, well, I had a lie, I didn't, you know, that's what your flesh wants you to believe. It's a lie. Your flesh is lying to you. The Bible is true. No lie is of the truth. And so when you lie, uh, the Holy Spirit is grieved, and you need to repent. You need to say, Lord, I fumbled that ball. Forgive me by the blood of Yeshua. Uh, cleanse me, I pray, in his atonement. And I die to that whole thing. I die to that lie. I die to myself. I die to the whole mechanism, the whole kind of thinking process that got me into the stupidity of it. And sometimes you have to die to a relationship because you may have relationships that's based on a false foundation, a foundation of lust, not love, where you don't respect one another, but you take advantage of one another. Or a business deal that's based on mutual lies, a partnership with lying or something. You have to actually say, I died to that relationship in order to live for God. And so you have to take a look at this because living for God is what's going to be the blessing, the purpose of your life. And so the first thing is the Holy Spirit, grieve, grieve not the Holy Spirit, repent and die, die daily. I hope you're good and dead uh, to yourself, that you may be, a, you know, some of you look too alive. I hope you drop dead, okay? <laughs> that you might live for God. Die to yourself, that you might live for God. Now, this is what the Bible teaches us. So, so, and so the second command that he gives us is quench not the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.19. What's that mean? The Holy Spirit is trying to influence you. He's a burner. He's going to give you some passion. And so he's going to encourage you. And just, don't quench the desire. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants you to forgive someone. And you're saying, I'm not going to forgive. <laughs> if I forgive that person, they'll take advantage of me. They'll be worse for it. I'm not going to, that's like a stupid thing to do. I'm not going to forgive that person. Never, never, never. And so you are actually quenching the Holy Spirit. You say, well, what's that mean? You got to go back to number one again. You're grieving him all over again. And so you don't want to quench his influence in your life. And maybe he's saying to you, you know, you need to trust the Lord with your finances. You need to trust God with your time. You need to trust the Lord. Uh, with things. And you say, oh, you know, from a, you have to take it from my cold dead hand. Uh, all that. Well, that's just foolishness. You have to be responsive to him. You have to be yielded uh, to his influence and what he wants you to do. And so the third command, walk in the Holy Spirit, uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. What's that mean? Obey the word of God. Follow the word of God. Uh, walk in the Holy The Holy Spirit will empower you to do the will of God according to the word of God. And so you grieve not the Holy Spirit by repenting and saying, Lord, I just that was the dumbest thing I ever, sorry about that one. You know, whatever you want to do, may the blood of Yeshua cleanse me. Uh, and then you come to the second one, yielding yourself to the influence, not quenching the Holy Spirit, the influence he wants to have in your life. And then you obey the word of God and walk in the spirit. This is the model the Bible gives for every single believer to live the spirit-filled life. You say, well, I went to a congregation. They didn't teach that. They just said, you know, you got to get a, a hit in the head here and whatever else. Uh, and therefore, no, that, that, I appreciate getting hit in the head. I, I, I need a little hit in the head once in a while myself. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the normative way for all believers. Uh, so you want to be careful that you might be obedient and compliant live in compliance to the Holy Spirit, yielded to him, and therefore following the word of God, not your own passions, your own will, your own ideas, you know, your own kind of things and labeling, you know, putting God on it. I always wanted to be a bank robber. I think God gave me the skills. I got wired that way. Oh, look, uh, there's, a, there's a bank that's not good security. It must be an opportunity. The whole thing's wrong. There's nothing right about it. And so the fact that you can think about things, desire things, this doesn't make it the will of God. You have to be careful of leaning on your own understanding, but rather yielding yourself to who he is and what he would have you do with your life. Whether it be in your marriage, whether it be at work, whether it be at school, in the community, wherever, 
Uh, you want to be living in the Holy Spirit and be ready to serve him wherever that may be. And so uh, we come to the second point now. Uh, uh, it, uh, rebellion brings the retribution for your continual wickedness with no repentance. Uh, and so an evil spirit from the Adonai, the Lord, uh, troubled him. And so you may be under the influence of evil influences, not the Holy Spirit. You say, well, it's a spiritual infant. Yeah, it could be an unholy spirit. Uh, be careful. Uh, you'll know them by the fruits. And so uh, when we consider, notice it says, from Adonai. Um, and so when we understand this kind of matter, let's take a moment to understand what's being said here. Uh, the spirit of Adonai, his own spirit, uh, was what was referred to. Now this is not saying a spirit, an evil spirit of Adonai. It's not saying an evil spirit of Adonai. From. You see the word from? Okay, you good? And so let's understand here. Uh, you say, is he always this nerdy about words? I'm on good behavior. You should see me when I really get going. So in any case, the evil spirit from Adonai, what's that mean? Well, moral evil is contrary to God's holy nature. In other words, uh, it says, in, uh, notice if you will, can you, see, can you see the portion from James 1.13 or Jacob 1.13? Let's read that in unison together. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. And so you say, well, how come I'm doing evil? It's not from, God doesn't want you to do evil. That circumstance was developed by God for you to be a victor. It was a test. But when you, when you respond according to your flesh, you will end up having a temptation that God did not want you to do evil. And so uh, the word that's used there, this will be helpful for you, for your studies. The word evil, ra'ah, uh, in the Hebrew, uh, the word is used in a variety of ways. Uh, so evil uh, doesn't just mean moral evil. Uh, it's, many times it's used as calamitous, like having a, a horrible thing happen. Uh, and so uh, that's how it's used in many scriptures here. Uh, and so God sent a calamity on this rebel king. So you can see how that same word is used uh, in Isaiah 45, uh, verse 7. Uh, the one forming light and creating darkness, that's God, causing well-being and creating calamity, ra'ah. It says, I am Adonai who does all these. And so God is the God of it all. He takes responsibility for his universe. Our response to those issues will show whether we trust the Lord or, my goodness, uh, you're, you're, you made it so I can't play golf today. It's raining. I'm not, I don't like you anymore. Or words like that. Well, sure, if you're going to respond poorly uh, to God because things aren't going your way, you're going to find that you're not going to have the blessings you actually want. His way is actually better than your way. Uh, that's what he's trying to teach us all. And so, not only was it from Adonai, but when we read through the Bible, we see it was always for Adonai as well. And so, for his, first of all, his retribution. What you sow, you will reap. And so, divine justice is perfectly fair. It may not seem fair to you. You say, I only told a lie and the guy fired me. One stupid lie and he fired me. That seems like an overreaction. That's how all people feel when they're caught in sin. Everything doesn't seem to be, why was I sent to prison? Uh, why was this done to me? But know what you sow, you reap. And so divine retribution is involved here. And so there's times when God has to bring the hammer down, there has to be punishment, etc. But you have to understand something about God. Uh, it's like parents. Uh, parents have to correct their children. Uh, you say, hold it a second. My son said he was in charge. Okay. He did his job. Now do your job and say, no, you're not. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, parents have to bring correction. But they do not have children just to correct people. <laughs> they, have ch they have children because they love children. Not because they're just looking to kind of, you know, whack someone around the room. These are demented, psychotic people. And so, and so understand, God is not psychotic uh, it's, or demented. He, has, he created us to love us, to bless us, 
to give us victory every time. So when the Bible talks about him having to bring some punishment or correction, it says of him that it's atypical. It's called a strange work for God to do because he is God who loves. God is love. And so when he has to bring corrections like a parent having to chastise their children because it's in the best interest of the child, you know, you have to love the child too much to let them get away with nonsense. The only discipline they'll have is the best discipline parents give them. And the, sociopath, uh, the, the sociopaths are those who are not disciplined. No one loved them or did anything. They're left to their own devices, and therefore they become totally self-centered, sociopathic creatures uh, and need very much deliverance from that. And so this is not how God works. He loves us and cares for us. But nonetheless, uh, he's a God of love. And so this is what it says, Isaiah 28, 21, For Adonai shall be angry that he may do his strange work and bring to pass his strange act. This is, very, this is like atypical for God. Why? Because he wants to bless you. He wants to love you. And therefore, when you do things that are contrary to his will and not in your best interests. Even though a child thinks, you know, it's all good. Uh, but nonetheless, our father has to sometimes uh, remind us of what's in our best interests. And sometimes that's pretty severe. But God is not mocked. What a man sows, what a person sows, he also or she also will reap. And so those who deny his grace receive the disgrace. Uh, this, God turns us over to the very things you desire. And so, uh, secondly, it's not only for retribution, it's for Adonai's redemption. This is hard to understand, but this is what the Bible teaches. Everything God does is to redeem people, to restore people. Everything he does, uh, everything he does, is to bring them to a place and so, or whatever the issues may be. And so it talks about evil spirit in Young's literal translation. Uh, it actually translates spirit of sadness. Uh, <laughs> uh, interesting translation. But nonetheless, he's getting the sense of it, that uh, the Lord is trying to bring Saul uh, to a place where he kind of says, this is like, what, what was I doing rebelling against God? Was I crazy? Was I stupid? Yes, you were crazy. Yes, you were stupid. Now repent. Uh, and so you want, you say, well, hold this a second. I've got issues in my life. Well, fine. Uh, and we can help you with those issues because God, uh, and you say, well, I had a poor childhood. Uh, yeah, you're, 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 not, you're not what your parents said you are. You're who God says you are. Don't be stop believing your parents and all the traumas of that. Start believing what God says about you and who God says you are. Uh, yeah, you're a sinner but you're forgivable and he wants to forgive you to be a child of god that you might uh, be a victor in life and be blessed in life and so be careful of that you say well i'm getting my dna tested uh, because you know i may find out i'm jewish good <laughs> this may not be known to many people but i've been placed in charge of collecting the back dues of those who find out they're jewish and so we hope you do it. Our finances can help be helped by that. So please, if you find out you're Jewish, please let me know. I'll tell you what your back fees are for being part of the, 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 you know, the tribe. Uh, and so, yeah. And so you say, well, what about my DNA? What about my ancestry? You are not your ancestry. You're a new creation. People are trying to discover themselves. They're trying to go into ancestry and all the, the genealogical records. You're a new creation in the Lord. You have to start living like a new creation. You are not merely the result of your ancestral records. Oh, now I realize why I'm such an angry person. Wow, that justifies me. No, you're a sinner. But you can be forgiven and have new life. You're a new creation in the Lord. And so we want to understand that everything that God is doing to bring you to your senses, to have you realize what God can do for you if you only trust him and stop looking into all these weird things that have to do with uh, your own sense of personal validation rather than what God wants to do in your life. 
And so, uh, yeah, and so uh, this was all meant for Saul to be brought back to repent, and for, that's all God ever desires, uh, etc. Let's look at the scriptures we have from the Tanakh, uh, the Hebrew scriptures as well. Let's read, start at the top, and then read the second one as well. Here we go. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. Second Peter, the Lord is not slow, patient toward you, not desiring for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. This is the heart of God. Every time he brings a discipline, a chastening, even something horrific in your life, it's for purposes that have to do with your redemption, your restoration. And you have to yield to the Lord in the midst of it that he might bring a blessing on your life. And so these are the things that he does and permits uh, in order to bring you back. But the question is, will you respond to him? Will you respond to him? You know, I had a relative uh, who was very wealthy in his business, uh, and he was so wealthy he didn't need God. Uh, that was his excuse. The reason people don't come to faith is because they love darkness rather than light. But his excuse was that. So I prayed that God would take it all away. Uh, you say, Sam, I want you to pray for me. You may think twice after this. <laughs> and so I prayed that God would destroy his business and anything that keeps him uh, from coming to faith. And so the business went bankrupt overnight. It was the best answer to prayer I ever had. <laughs> and so I saw the guy, and I said, well, well, what do you think? He says, I'll get it all back again. <laughs> Pride can be stronger than your, your common sense. You know, validation your pride, foolish man that he is. But nonetheless, God wants to uproot that foolishness, come to repentance, and live for the Lord accordingly. Let's take a look at some scriptures here that deal with this issue here. First of all, it's a common problem you see in Psalm, let's read Psalm 81, verse 11 to 12. But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. God gives you over to your own foolishness. I got to touch the hot stove. Don't touch the hot stove. I got to touch the hot stove. Don't touch the hot stove. I just got to touch the hot stove. Oh, you broke. Okay. Oh, it hurts. Why didn't you warn me? Yeah, well, me and the rest of humanity was telling you not to touch the hot stove. But you're kind of got stupid, you know, kind of thing. Don't sleep with that woman. I got to sleep with her. Don't sleep with that guy. But he says he likes me. Gavalt, get married. Uh, understand that God's word is to protect us. But if you're going to be resistant, not listen to his voice, not obey him, you're, you're, God is going to give you over to your own foolish desires. Uh, let's read Psalm 119, verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. I remember, you know, that was a verse very meaningful to me growing up. You know, I was a very rebellious young man. Hard to tell now, I know. Uh, and, and, and I remember thinking, you know, bar mitzvah. I'm, I'm kind of an introvert. And so my father told you know, go and get bar mitzvah. And I said, that's like in front of people, right? He said, yeah. You're going to be, yeah, of course. I said, I, I don't want to do that. I don't like getting in front of people, Dad. He explained it in a way that was so clear. I said, you never explained it that way before. I see. So before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. <laughs> and so many times, you know, God has to get your attention in various situations, etc. And so why? Because he wants to bless you uh, as you keep his word. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 30 and 32. Here we go. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and the number sleep. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so we will not be condemned alone. This is why God's doing it. He brings this chastening. He, brings, he allows you know, the evil one uh, to actually have his way in your life, because you're not willing to listen to God. And so he uses the evil one in order to be like a, a rod upon you, to bring you to your senses. Uh, this is what God is, and you say, I don't want that to be. Well, repent. How simple can it be? Trust God. Come back to the Lord and recognize what a fool I was. 
thinking that, you know, I could kind of get away with things and do things. Don't be foolish. And so a number of weak and sick, and when it says a number sleep, uh, it didn't mean to wake you up. Just not, no, no, it meant die. Uh, when believers die, it says go to sleep, so to speak, because their bodies are in the grave. Uh, that person, etc., goes to be with the Lord. But the fact is that God has to bring such severe discipline, as you can see, because people just don't want to yield to him. And the best interest, therefore, you can't be a witness here anymore. Maybe he has to take you home. Maybe it just going to, it's going to be worse off for you. And he loves you too much, uh, knowing that you can just... So the Lord disciplines whom he loves. And so what do we do about this? Flee to Adonai by faith in Yeshua. This is, there's no other option. It's like a third choice here. You're either spirit-filled under the influence of the Holy Spirit, or you're under the enemy's influence. That's the only thing going on. You say, well, I'm doing it myself. You're self-deceived. You don't understand the nature of this world. That the small g God of this world, read with me 1 John 5, 19. Here we go. We know that we are from God, and that the whole world lies of the evil one. Do you understand that? You're fooling yourself by saying, I'm just doing my own thing. No, you don't understand. You're opening your up, yourself up to evil influences. Even though you say, well, no one found out. No one knows about it. You're fooling yourself. God loves you and cares about you. There's no neutral territory in spiritual warfare. But you may be neutralized. You've hardened your heart to God. Repent of that. Come to faith in the Lord while you still can. While it makes sense to you in some way. Otherwise you'll get harder and harder and harder. You say, well, well maybe I, I like being here. Your bagels are good. I'm so sorry to hear that. And so let's understand that the result of that verse uh, and the, this evil spirit troubled him. This is what, why spirit of sadness, he, nothing but trouble in his life. And so what comes out of a person's heart is what defiles him. This is what's going on, Yeshua taught us. And so the angry heart is the enemy's home. Is your heart the enemy's home? Is anger, being suspicious minded, lustful, lying, fear driven. Is this what your lifestyle is? Then your heart is the enemy's home, not the Holy Spirit's place of power in your life. And so as we consider the matter of the calamity of wretchedness, uh, the final step uh, uh, for Saul here, the calamity of wretchedness, the word trouble. Uh, it's, uh, in his life, when you study through the next number of chapters here regarding Saul, you see envy, suspicion, rage, fear, dread, terror, despair, all of this. He was like a crazy man sometime, caught up in the whole issue of his own wickedness. And so uh, anger, anger is a nasty illusion created by a troubled soul. Do you have a troubled soul? God wants to actually make a difference in your life. He wants to bring peace to your soul, a peace that comes to the Prince of Peace. He wants to bring help to your life. And so without the restraining work of the Holy Spirit, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, the Holy Spirit brings restraint on our life so we don't, get, or get, we don't give ourselves over to the worst of things, praise God. But when the Holy Spirit uh, is not going, when you're going to resist him, and then your natural weakness, weaknesses uh, will bring about all kinds of unbridled passion and wicked things that you never thought you could ever think of, let alone do. And so spiritual oppression, when, you, when you're not walking with the Lord, uh, you're putting yourself into the domain of darkness, back under the influence of evil again. And when you're spiritually oppressed, it can appear like you're possessed. You're doing such wacky, stupid things with your money, your time, your talent. You're not being reasonable. You're not understanding the way of the Lord. There's a way that seems right to a person, but the end is the way of death. And so you've got to be listen to people who love you. To live for the Lord is the best way to live. It's the way you're created. And so there's a calming of wretchedness. We read about that. Uh, spirit filled David. The uh, Spirit of God came on him. And so he played his psalms on his harp, which temporarily relieved uh, Saul's uh, affliction. 
Uh, you say, what do you mean? Uh, this wretched condition that he had, uh, there's alleviating comforts, uh, all kinds of things, uh, music and company and distractions. What's your, what do you use to alleviate? Uh, what, what, what do you do to kind of alleviate uh, the issues, the problems, and the struggles that you're going through? Is it your work? You know, some of you would not be a wholesome person if you didn't have work every day. Too much time on your hands, you know? You don't know what you might get yourself into. Uh, be careful when you retire. Uh, you may find yourself with time that you don't know what to do with now. And now, unless it's used for the Lord, it's being used carnally, and therefore it's going to bring uh, it's subject to his chastening. And so, what do you mean? Well, there are many people who come here, you know? Uh, they love hymns or they love worship songs or whatever it is. They think religion and they get calmed by it all, you know. Uh, and so they say, yeah, I need my once a week fix. Uh, oh boy, I'll tell you, I live a life. I need a once a week. Yeah, well, that's calming, but it's not a cure. It's not a cure. Don't leave home without him. He wants to fill you. He wants to be with you wherever you go, whatever you do. And so I don't know what you have. Uh, but maybe there's weapons of mass distraction, as I have up there, uh, that you utilize you know, on Facebook all the time or Instagram or whatever it may be, and that distract you from life itself. You poor dears. You're not living life. You're living a virtual life. You're not living life. You don't understand what life is. Life is living for the Lord. This is the blessing of God, caring about others, reaching out, making a difference, because God created you to have an impact in this world by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what God has for us. And so what's the cure of his wretchedness and yours and mine? Yeshua. He is the cure for it all. Luke 7, 21, let's read it together. At that very time, Yeshua cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits. And they gave sight to many who were blind. Right now he wants to help you. The same God, the same yesterday, today and forever. He wants to deliver you from the domain of darkness. But it was only those who would come to him, not those who would not come to him. Let's read John 14, 1 and 27. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Can you see the difference he can make in your life? Trust him. He's the prince of peace. He's in charge of it. He can give peace to your heart and to your home, he, to your life. You can be a peacemaker then and make a difference. If you'll submit to God, you'll be able to resist the devil and the influence thereof, etc. And so he is the bridge over troubled water. I'm not going to sing for you. I feel tempted. <laughs> but I'm afraid, you know, we'll lose more people than we can afford. So. But the tr that's the truth. That's the truth of it all. This is a troubling world, but he is the bridge over troubled water. He's the one who can make the difference in our life. And so as we consider uh, concluding applications here, just to reiterate, and so the question comes up, have you trusted in Yeshua for your atonement, for forgiveness of your sins, for, for cleansing of sin for your soul? Uh, have you come to faith in him? Uh, and so therefore receiving by faith in him, receiving the indwelling Holy Spirit, that God will give you what you need when you trust in the Lord. This is the, the best deal you're going to get. Free, eternal life, uh, the most blessed life you can imagine. Are you living uh, the spirit-filled life? As a believer, if you're a believer, are you living the spirit-filled life? Are you compliant to those three commands? Are you grieving not uh, the Holy Spirit uh, by repenting? Those whom I love, he says, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Be zealous and repent. Die to those things. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry I depended upon that. I'm sorry for those wicked thoughts. I'm sorry for the fantasy world of my mind that I used to escape to. Uh, I forgive me for all of that and fill me now that I might honor you in my thought life, in my life, in my time, my treasure, and all that I have. Uh, and quench not the Holy Spirit. Be responsive. Be yielded to him. 
uh, that he might be influential in your life and influencing you for what he wants you to do. And then by the word of God, obey the word. Uh, that this is the lamp unto your feet. This is the guidance, direction for your life. God created you on purpose and live out his purpose as you follow the word of God. This is what God has for the people of God. The victory, not the defeat. The blessing, not the curse. God wants to bless you. Yeshua became curse in your place. So you would not be under the curse of sin, but be delivered and be a blessing to the name of our God and to everyone around you as well. Let's pray. As we bow our hearts before God, if you're a visitor here or maybe live streaming or in the overflow rooms, uh, when we come to this point, we yield our heart to God. We just yield to him that we might, he might do a work in our life. Maybe he surfaced some areas of your life you need to turn over to him. Areas where you've been hardened to his will. Maybe in your finances. Maybe with your time. Maybe with your abilities, your talents. Maybe in your relationships. Whatever it may be. Bring them to the Lord. Let him cleanse you. Repent of it and die to it. Lord, that was wrong. I died to it. Uh, that I might live for God in those situations. Uh, and then the Lord will not only cleanse you, but make you an instrument of good news to others. Uh, so yield your heart. If there's something in your heart, pray this simple prayer. This might be helpful to you. Pray this simple prayer along with me. Dear God, forgive me for my selfishness. Forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for all my sins. Cleanse them away through the atonement of Messiah. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. In Yeshua's name, amen.